This new book that's just appeared from MIT Press, Sounding Bodies, Music and the Making of Biomedical Science, as Jessica said, joins, joins two kind of siblings, two earlier books. Um, the, the next one, the, the earliest one, was called Music and the Making of Modern Science. That appeared in 2014, and then Polyphonic Minds, Music of the Hemisphere. They're not really a trilogy in the sense that they each of them stand by themselves, but they do are siblings in the sense that they're all concerned with a common subject, which is the relationship of music and science. I grew up somehow fascinated with both music and science since my childhood and struggled for the longest time with a question that people would always ask, which was, why is it that scientists are so interested in music or musicians so interested in science? And it struck me that the answer was not so much what I grew up hearing, which was somehow that music was scientific, um, that side of it, so much as the other side that that science is musical, and I mean musical in a very specific sense, that that um, what these books are really arguing um, is that the sciences, the modern sciences as we know them, are the children of the ancient liberal arts and especially of music. And this came about through a very extraordinary series of events, very fateful in ancient Greece, where the Pythagorean movement gave the first connection between um, a mathematics and physical phenomena, specifically the sounds of bells and uh, ringing glasses and strings and even hammers in a blacksmith shop, as in this famous old illustration, w w that, that Pythagoras, at least according to the legend, understood that the constant musical intervals corresponded to simple whole number ratios, that one to two was an octave, two to three was a fifth. This was a fateful, this was a fateful moment because it was taken up not just by the Pythagoreans, but by Plato above all, who decided to change the nature of education. And to this day, the, the change holds that instead of what people were doing at that point, which was basically, if they were lucky enough to get an education, basically only men and those that were free, they basically me memorized Homer and learned to do a few, a little bit of arithmetic. But Plato argued that education should be a kind of philosophic journey, which would begin with three, which would have seven liberal arts, several, seven, a sevenfold path, the first three parts of which had to do with um, letters and understand logic and grammar. But the higher part was a fourfold path called the quadrivium, the four roads, which would be as you see on the screen here from a medieval illustration, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. And these four sisters were the, the center of liberal education until about the time of Isaac Newton. Um, and the liberal arts still represent for us today the kind of crucial touchstone for what, what education is to be. In Music and the Making of Modern Science, I was trying to find out how that then played out for music, uh, for, for the physical and mathematical sciences above all. But in this new book, I became interested in what were the implications then for other sciences and medicine in particular, which stood outside of the liberal arts. They were not part of that same curriculum. They were not among this very small uh, sisterhood of four. And what I'm trying to argue in this book is that that these Pythagorean ideas had a deep influence on the development of medicine and the biomedical sciences in several ways. First of all, because medicine, which originally was quite outside um, the, the, uh, the classical liberal arts, came to know its siblings, these these four sisters, and then the children that they had, the physical sciences and mathematical sciences, and that had a deep influence on medicine. And then, uh, so that, that also, then the other part of my book is trying to show the ways in which music in particular had a very particular effect through, its, through the Pythagorean ideas on the development of medicine and the biomedical sciences. Um, this took a longer time and it was a more complicated path than it was in the physical sciences, although there too it took a very, very long time for it to play out. But the crucial figure in the story, a kind of hero whom I discovered and I'd never known about, is this man Herophilus. Uh, 
who is called by Vesalius the prince of anatomists, uh, standing next to his colleague Aristotus from a medieval illustration. Herophilus was a physician and anatomist in third century BC Alexandria, along with Aristotus. And there he was made crucial anatomic discoveries. The base of the sinuses is named after him, the wine press of uh, Herophilus. He, he made crucial discoveries having to do with the uh, the reproductive system of both men and women. He was also the first person to train a woman to practice medicine, which is also a very interesting story, which I was totally surprised by. The way in which he influenced later medicine, though, in particular, is he took these Pythagorean ideas about whole number ratios, and he decided he would apply them to the pulse. He decided that there are different kinds of pulses that had different rhythms, which he associated with the rhythms of poetry and music. And if the rhythms were consonant and, and well ordered, as in the sense of the simple ratios that make consonances in melody, the patient was healthy. And the more complex and disordered they became, the more there was an indication of disease. This idea became enormously influential because although not a single word of Herophilus's own texts has survived to the present day, Galen, the famous uh, physician, a Greek physician who lived and worked in ancient Rome, took up Herophilus's ideas and popularized them. Um, he was not uncritical of them and not unquestioning of them, but he thought that they were fascinating and deserved much more investigation as a kind of new path into medicine. Because one of the main ways in which I think that the Pythagoreans influenced medicine was to guide Greek medicine towards becoming a rational practice, as opposed to what Egyptian and Babylonian medicine had been as sophisticated as they were, in which the gods and theological considerations were always mixed in with purely medical and clinical. A, a, a Egyptian physician would give you a prescription and tell you also that you'd better go to the temple and make certain sacrifices and, and be, you know, work it out with the gods. Um, the Greeks, starting with the, um, the Hippocratics and then Galen, didn't do this at all. As much, they, they made medicine a practice which was purely devoted to causal factors that were Super, purely natural, not, nothing of the influence of the gods. So that was, I think, behind the scenes, a very important effect. So the story that my book tells is how Herophilus's ideas were spread by Galen, were listened to very, very attentively by the, by the Arab and Persian physicians and by the medieval physicians who learned uh, Galen's ideas from them. And many, many people not only read and respected these ideas as coming from the ancients, but wanted to test them and try them out and find out how they really worked and what they meant. So they became a subject of an ongoing discussion, not just copied slavishly, but were tested in various ways and questioned. Um, this process went on until what I call a kind of sonic turn that happened in the West in the 18th century. By then, already after about 1500 or so, the texts, the classical texts of Galen and the Hippocratics had become more and more available, including all these references to Herophilus. And so the controversy then became something that lived inside Western medicine. Now, alongside with this, and we will sort of set this aside for a moment, um, the other movement that's going on, which is a tremendous shift in the nature of medicine itself, went from the picture that the earliest physicians, the Hippocratics, had of the body, which was essentially in terms of liquids, which they called humors, the four humors, um, blood, phlegm, black bile, yellow bile, these four were like the four elements, except that they took place in the context of the body. What was happening with that, what I was about to describe was a tremendous shift in the understanding of what the body was that really happened over the course of the 17th and 18th centuries. It partly happened as a result of an interaction with a very extraordinary disease called tarantism. This was a, a strangely local disease, which was associated with the very bottom of the heel of Italy that you see here in an old illustration, with showing these tarantulas, which are supposed to, by their bite, cause a very strange kind of depressive malady in which the, the patient would fall into a kind of a stupor and could only be revived 
by the application of music and dance. And once they heard the, the right kind of music, which seemed to be associated with the kind of spider that bit them, um, that the patient would often get up out of their bed from their lethargy, start to dance, and they would dance for hours or sometimes even days until they collapsed, and then were restored to health. Athanasius Kircher, the famous Jesuit um, uh, kind of polymath, collected um, not only all kinds of stories from his Jesuit fellow informants about this disease, but also wrote down on this manuscript here the antidote, one of the musical antidotes for the tarantula. It sounded like this. <laughs> And you could see that that musical example has been played by a contemporary group absolutely after the notation of the music that you see there, which is very interesting in itself. This condition of tarantism became tremendously controversial because up until this time, physicians had never treated depression or mental conditions as such. Those were left to priests. They were considered usually cases of demoniacal possession. But there are stories that I talk about in the book in which priests are engaged in trying to exorcise the, the, the demons that have been afflicting one of these people when some musicians walk by playing their music and the patient completely ignores the priests and runs after the, 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 the musicians and starts dancing. So there is a tremendous controversy. So it became a medical matter because it was a poison bite. So suddenly physicians got involved in this because it seemed to fall into their traditional domain of dealing with physical complaints in particular. But no one could decide whether it was real or false, whether it was faked. Um, whether the poison really caused this or not. And there's a, a controversy that I talk about went on and on. And in trying to understand what was going on, what kind of a disease, what kind of a disease could even appear to be cured by music, there came into play a whole new view of the body that had been growing, but which this disease brought into prominence. And this was that the body was not so much a collection of fluids but of solids, in particular of fibers. Already the ancients had talked about five different kind of fiber structures, which Vesalius diagrammed in his famous book. But Vesalius carried this on as an illustration of, in this case, the musculature of the back, um, and as a way of understanding, first of all, the static structure of the body. Descartes speculated that, in fact, the nerves were fibers like this, he thought that they were actually hollow and were filled with air and operated like a kind of pipe organ. He makes that explicit comparison so that the body was a kind of musical instrument. And then the beginnings of drawings in the microscope, you see Van Leeuwenhoek's famous drawing of the microstructure of a fiber, which shows this kind of lace work. Other, other investigators like uh, Giovanni Borelli tried to figure out that if there were these fibers, they might not just be static uh, constituents who are that sort of weave together the fabric of the body, but in fact, they could be machines. They could be responsible for the dynamism of the body. Because if they were fibers, very quickly people realized those fibers could move, they could contract, they would explain the operation of the muscles and especially of the heart. And then finally, they could vibrate. And their vibrational states would then be given an explanation of what was going on, for instance, in the case of tarantism, that in fact that the music was making the, the fibers of the body, especially of the nerves, vibrate in such a way as to have some kind of a physiological effect. 
In this very interesting example, this comes from an opera by Jean-Philippe Rameau, in which he's telling the story of Pygmalion, a sculptor that brings his a beautiful statue to life. In this example, in this scene, this is the very moment in which the statue comes to life, and it comes to life as a result of the listening to a chord. The vibrations of this chord, which is just a triad of E major, brings the, uh, brings the statue to life. Um, Rameau himself was fascinated with what he called the corps sonore, the sounding body, the vibrating body, which he thought was the basis of music itself. In this scene, you'll hear the triad and the voice of uh, Pygmalion, the sculptor, saying, where do these chords come from? What are these harmonious sounds? A, a vivid brightness is spread throughout this place, and then there's a silence, and then as the score says, the statue comes to life. In this understanding, music was, in that sense, the secret of life itself. Um, so now we return to the story I was telling you about Herophilus' ideas. They came back in the 18th century, and in particular, this rather obscure book by uh, uh, Nicolas, François Nicolas Marquet, a, a easy and curious new method to know the pulse by musical notes, decided that he would take up um, Herophilus' ideas, and he wrote down a, a minuet which would give the musical representation of a, of a well-regulated natural pulse, in which the pulse beat, and this is not being heard, it's being felt, because all these pulses that we've been talking about up until now have been felt by the, 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 by the physician, not in any way rendered audible. And this is how this little minuet sounds. the pulses here. So, and Marquet also decided he would write, try to write down the various kinds of pulse indicating pathology of the heart, capering or convulsive or double pulse. And, but the notation that you see here on the left is very close to the notation of the the jagged dotted uh, convulsive intervals of a French overture, like the overture to Rameau's Hippolyte at IC. <laughs> So it was that, that, that the attempt to understand the functioning of the heart and of the pulse through music is, was deeply influenced by the music that Marquet knew, which makes perfect sense. The next step follow, took this uh, idea from a, a notion of pulse or rhythm that was pure, purely felt to something that was actually heard in the body. And it was taken by a man named Leopold Ohrenberger, who is a physician, was also deeply musical. He wrote the first book about the percussion of the, you know, the hitting of the human thorax to evoke sounds, which all of us have experienced from a physician. Alan Brugger's daughter, Marianne, was a very, uh, very fine pianist to whom Haydn dedicated several sonatas and herself wrote a sonata, unfortunately called here her first and last work, but was at least published um, with a preface by her teacher, Salieri. 
So the body itself was turning out to be a musical instrument could, that could be sounded by percussion. But more than that, Lenek um, realized that the body was a musical instrument that was autonomously producing all kinds of sounds, and which he rendered more audible through the method of the stethoscope. You see his original stethoscope there, and you see a famous illustration of him using not this, he's holding the stethoscope, but curiously, he's putting his, his ear to the, to the chest, which is immediate auscultation. He coined this word for the very, very careful listening to the sounds that are emerging from the body. Lenek himself was deeply musical. He played the flute. He was very interested in Breton sound songs, and he collected music that was emerging from his patients' bodies. For instance, one on one day he actually heard this sound, kind of whistling sound, coming out of one of his patients. And maybe it's just a coincidence, but it's something like a Breton song, song that he probably knew. So there's a kind of convergence between his intense listening to his patients and his, ex which he, like the others, somehow viewed in terms of his own sonic experience and his intense knowledge and interest in, in Breton songs. So um, it, he had, in fact, to go beyond music itself because the sounds that come out of the body and are heard through a stethoscope are not generally musical sounds. They're complex sounds that sound more like, I don't know, what electronic or computer music or something like that. And he had to develop a whole language, which still remains in use today, of the bruit, of the sounds that are made, the noises that are made by the body, and that a physician has to know the um, the hal, the, the kind of the the, the, the different sounds that are characteristic of different amounts of fluid in the lungs, of different kinds of pathology, um, which medical students, at least until some time ago, had to spend quite a long time learning. But this sonic turn, this revolutionized medicine because this is the first time that the body could be seen inside because vision stops. Even the most penetrating gaze of a physician stops at the edge of the body, but through the stethoscope and through percussion, it was possible to obtain crucial information about the interior of the body. And this, the, this is another major theme of my book, then how that developed, especially how it carried on through ultrasound, which I won't speak about tonight. Um, I would like to talk, though, about um, another whole story which is, happens later on and which has to do with how the activity of the nerves, the electrical activity of the nerves, became understood through sound in a very special way. This began with Luigi Galvani's famous experiment showing that a frog's leg would, um, if, it were, if it were stimulated by electric current, would twitch. This is, this is his famous illustration showing the frog's leg and, uh, and uh, Leiden jars and other things to generate and store the electricity. On the other hand, Emile dubois Raymond, then about a century, half century later, showed the reverse effect, that if you contract your muscle, you can make a galvanometer or a current meter move. And that's what's happening here in this illustration. There's even an a helpful arrows on the young man showing the direction is put up on a shelf so it won't feel any vibration, but he tenses up the muscles. Um, while, and the, the electrical current between his two hands is being picked up by conducting fluid in the jars there. So the idea is the, the, the sense that the muscles not only respond to electrical stimuli, but produce them was, was crucial and became a focus, central focus of the de development of neurology and physiology in the 19th century. In order to probe this, the great uh, physician and scientist Hermann von Helmholtz used tuning forks. So here is a one of his devices in which a tuning force fork is used to produce an, uh, an alternating current of a very specific frequency, I mean the frequency of the tuning fork, which he could then use to stimulate the muscles at that frequency. So it was now a much more probing investigation, not merely applying a 
shock or a spark as Galvani did, but now applying a very controlled electrical current, controlled in frequency, to see what would happen. In the process of decoding what happened, a sound became crucial, especially after the uh, telephone was invented, because you could not only attach a telephone to a frog's nerve and listen to the nerve, but you could sing into the telephone using it as a microphone to stimulate that nerve. So here's an 1895 photograph in which the note C is sung through a telephone. Because of a quirk of the experiment, you can see on the very top line, the galvanometer started to record the vibrations of the note C even before the nerve responded. And you could see in the central black line there the response of the nerve, which included the characteristic negative dip at, that happens at the very beginning of the oscillation, which was was noticed already by Dubois Raymond and was puzzled, was very puzzling to people and was a very, very important piece of information as they tried to figure out what would be the chemistry that, that would go in the chemistry of the nerves and the nervous system that would go with these electrical signals and that would generate and respond to signals like this. But in this case, it, the, the telephones was a the sound, the production and the registering of the sound was a crucial part of investigating the operation of the nerves. This, the main story I'd like to tell you here, which was to me a great surprise, had to do with the way in which that story moved towards its crucial point. The crucial point was the question of how exactly do the nerves work? Are they devices that register the stimuli that they either are sending or receiving um, in a kind of analog way? That is to say that they give currents that are greater or lesser according to whether they're more stimulated, or what turned out to be the case, a very surprising fact that they only are either on or off, never anything in between, called the all or nothing doctrine, and that the information that's transmitted by every nerve in our body and in every other body that has a nervous system of it known on Earth is takes place through the frequency of the number of those pulses, which is to say their rhythm. So this is a, a, a crucial finding about the nature of the nervous system, which was finally nailed down and proved conclusively by Edgar Adrian in the uh, late 20s and 30s, for which he received the Nobel Prize. Um, and the way in which he did it was through listening. That is to say, the problem was to really establish this idea, you, you couldn't just, you would have to find a single nerve and you'd have to observe the output of that single nerve by itself. To do that, since the organism is alive and it has to be alive and, and capable of registering things, so it can't, you, it has to be left intact. A very, very fine needle is passed into the nerve and finally and to, to locate a single nerve you have to listen to the sounds that happen and that's the way adrian did it he started to amplify using um three-stage vacuum tube amplifiers which just had become available shortly after the first world war and he started to apply these as a way of listening to what you would hear through the nerves and then gradually he realized that when you reached a single nerve you would hear a very definite signal this process of audio monitoring is still in use in every neurophysiology lab in the world and is a crucial technique that's taught to every student um, uh, even though it's not much discussed, but I, I will give you another example of it. And how does it sound? Well, when you listen to it, for instance, if this is an actual recording from a lab of Leslie Kay, a, a neuroscientist at the uh, University of Chicago, here is a recording of the hippocampus, in which you're going to hear a whole chorus of neurons. <laughs> Now, what she would do is that 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 then she would that was like somehow you have a microphone above a whole chorus of singers. Then, if you get closer and you finally get really close to one of them, this is what you hear.
So those are the impulse, and you can hear that the, 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 their quantization, the sense that each of them is either on or off, and that they're essentially the same, is auditorily manifest. You can hear it right away. In the diagram here, you see one of Adrian's experiments in which he inserted a needle into his own triceps and then gradually contracted it more and more and was able to record what he did, actually, is he took the sound and recorded the sound on a visual image, but he showed that the, the more he contracted the triceps, least of all in A, more in B, most of all in C, the faster would be the rhythm uh, of the contractions. So it, by this means, Adrian was able to establish definitively the all or nothing doctrine, which is the, the crucial, must be one of the most crucial discoveries in neuroscience in, in its entire history. Just to give you another example of the use of this technique, more recently, these are also Nobel Prize winning experiments by David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel at Harvard. And they were trying to experiment in the late 50s about how the cat or you know, the vertebrate uh, visual cortex worked. And just to show you the kind of problem, here are experiments that Hubel did showing uh, there's a, a, the cat is unrestrained and wandering around. And this picture shows the the trace that you get from the electrical apparatus, the top two registers shows that he's occur when he's waving his hand kind of slowly in front of the cat's eyes, and the bottom two shows he's waving them faster. And there's a kind of a difference, but it's not at all, um, it's not at all clear, and it would take a lot of training to learn to interpret it. To make their crucial discovery, though, they had to use hearing, and here you'll see a video in which they describe it. The researchers actually listened in to individual nerve cells firing in the anesthetized cat as they presented it with different visual images. When we started working, Torsten and I, in the late 50s, we set up our first experiments and they didn't go well because at the beginning we couldn't make the cells fire at all. We'd shine lights all over the screen and nothing seemed to work. And rather by accident, one day, we were shining small spots, either white spots or black spots, onto the screen. And we found that the black dot seemed to be working in a way that at first we couldn't understand until we found that it was the process of slipping the piece of glass into the projector, which swept a line, a very faint, precise, narrow line across the retina. And every time we did that, we'd get a response. And you heard in the background, I'm sorry that the video didn't play that would have showed that better. Um, you heard the sound of the neuron firing when the at the edge of the slide swept a kind of faint line directly across it so that this one neuron that they were hearing was sensitive only to uh, a line at that inclination and not to other lines, because if you if they turned the slide, you wouldn't hear that same firing. So this was a crucial piece of evidence for how the human visual cortex worked, for which they won later won the Nobel Prize. And it happened directly as a result of listening because they couldn't both do the experiment, which required them to be showing the cat various things and moving things around that they had to be looking at in real time. And at the same time, monitoring what the cat was, that one neuron in the cat was doing, um, for which sound then was essentially crucial. So that in his Nobel lecture, um, which you can watch online, Hubel uses the sound as a kind of critical part of the process of discovery. And in fact, Adrian, when he received the Nobel Prize, also played a gramophone record of neuron sounds. A gramophone record I tried to get very, very hard. But it shows you how fragile such sound records are that nowhere in the Nobel archives or anywhere else that I could look had this recording, which was so, so important to him, was it preserved. Um, one of the things I learned in the course of my investigation by talking with neuroscientists that worked with Hubel and Wiesel um, was that the, the sound which 
Hubel describes in his Nobel lectures as like a, a machine gun firing. That's his description. Uh, another younger neuroscientist that worked with him said that he found it a kind of thrilling sound that every time he heard it, that gradually when you reached a single neuron, you re that there was it was as if you were hearing a single musical voice. And he also told me something that surprised and even shocked me, which was that each neuron has a specific sound so that a person that's working, you know, with these is passing one of these needles through the brain, which is so fine that the, the animal or the person is unaware of it, they could recognize the neurons as they pass by their sound, by their voice. That has seemed to me a kind of an extraordinary thing. Just in conclusion, I'd like to talk about a few ways in which these ideas and techniques have come down to the present time. Although there's a whole um, yeah, genre of medical literature that it deplores the sort of the fading of the of stethoscopic listening as a crucial part of medical training, although it is practiced still and certainly practiced perhaps more by by nurses than by physicians at this point perhaps. Um, the 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 stethoscope has undergone a kind of renaissance as a digital device, and here you see a digital stethoscope attached to a uh, to a tablet so capable of transmitting its information over a great distance. So if you're out very far from a medical center in a, in a poor country where there are such centers are very few and far between, it's possible to obtain very important diagnostic information through such a simple device and send it for consultation. Similarly, ultrasound, now you can have an ultrasound device like this one being used in Uganda to diagnose a child, whether a child has pneumonia or not. The, the ultrasound probe is just like, looks like, a, like an electric shaver and he's using, uh, the physician is using uh, an iPhone to visualize it and was able to make a correct diagnosis. So ultrasound, which of course is very, very important in the, in the lab, as we all know, now has a new, new ability to enter, to be used in distant places and in, in, in settings far from normal hospitals. Another thing which has been experienced by many people is that, that the hearing of newborn infants can be checked, or certain aspects of the hearing can be checked immediately after birth through using otoacoustic emissions. This is the very surprising fact that the ear not only receives sounds, but actually produces them, which I was very surprised to hear, which had been predicted by a physicist in the, I believe in the uh, late 50s, and was completely ignored at the time. And he was so disgusted, he decided to become a cosmologist. He was a very distinguished person, Thomas Gold. But much later, people were able to find out that there, this phenomenon does exist. And here's a baby be undergoing this procedure. And I finally was able to locate what the sounds are like that they play into your ear. These sounds are then simply played into the infant's ear or to your ear, if you like. Um, and by the response of the ear, it, it's, it's possible to diagnose certain forms of um, impairment of, the, of, the, of hearing. Here's how it sounds. Sorry if that it's a little hard to take. And the last example I would like to give has to do with techniques of sonification. And this goes back to something that Adrian was also a pioneer in, which was taking EEG, electroencephalograph data, and making it audible. Now it's possible to use a very simple kind of device that you see here to diagnose, in particular, silent seizures. Apparently, um, in, uh, in intensive care units, many patients can be subject to these seizures, which are not epileptic seizures because they don't result in a, uh, a visible, any kind of visible um, uh, seizure, but can be happening in the brain and are potentially dangerous and need intervention. Normally, looking at an electroencephalogram can take, you know, finding the technician, um, scheduling it can take a long time. But if the, if the input from this simple device is sonified, People can be trained, it's been shown, and I think you'll see why, can be trained very quickly to recognize the difference between the normal sound of the brain. Here's how the brain sounds normally. It's kind of funny that it's such a dull, 
kind of sound, but that is, that is the sound of a normal, healthily functioning brain, so-called pink noise. If the, and, it, and to do this, because the brain's, uh, the frequencies that we're speaking about here are rather low. They're about eight, 10 cycles per second. So they would be considered really rhythms. You could hear them as rhythms because any pitch that's below about 30 cycles per second, which is like near the bottom of a piano keyboard, doesn't really sound as a pitch, but can be felt as a series of pulsations. So in this case, what's done is that an algorithm is used to, to take the input of the brain and simply to move it up into a frequency where you can hear it. If the patient is having a silent seizure, the sonified brainwaves sound like this. <laughs> very recognizable. I'm sure you agree. Kind of scary, actually. <laughs> so uh, through this technique, I mean, a monitor can be set up. And if there is, if there's some kind of a sound, sound like that, that starts to come out, then you, then you realize that something is going on. These are just a few examples to show you how sound and, and, and music have be, been a crucial part of the development of the biomedical sciences, not just uh, through music therapy, which is what many people would think of, which is valuable in itself. But my book has really been interested in ways in which um, sound, music first and sound have become, have influenced the fundamental structure of, of music and the biomedical, of medicine and the biomedical sciences. Thank you very much. Thanks. Jessica. Yes, thanks. Sorry, I was just unmuting myself. Thanks, Peter. Um, fine. Let's see, I'm going to stop the screen share and we'll put you back back up on the screen here. Give me just a moment. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, that was one of the more fascinating talks I think we've hosted, I, at least from my perspective. <laughs> thank you for sharing all of that. Um, I'd like to go ahead and um, open this up for the Q&A session. So if anyone has questions to ask, um, please feel free just to type them in the chat box. Or if you'd like to use your voice and speak, just be aware that it'll be captured in the recording we're doing right now. Um, and maybe what I'll do, Dr. Pesic, is um, just start us off with a question. Um, if music influenced biomedical science along the way, surely there were some wrong ideas as well as correct ones. What were some of the wrong ideas and what happened to them? Oh, thank you. Thank you for the question, which, which, yeah, that's something I've been thinking about and wondering about. Um, in a way, a lot of the ideas that were influential were wrong, wrong headed in a certain sense from the beginning. Even if you think about um, uh, the, the idea that Herophilus had that the pulse had ratio rhythmic ratios like octaves in two to three, I in a certain sense I think that that was probably wrong from the beginning because the way it turned out it was not that people were able to find those ratios and that there were some ratios but not other ratios, but that the idea that the rhythm of the pulse was diagnostic. The, the larger idea was right, even though the specific form in which it first occurred to him was in a certain sense quite wrong. And, and but the, the strange thing was that the wrongness of his idea actually engaged people more than if he had said, had somehow managed third century, you know, before the common era to have said like, well, maybe it's not the Pythagorean ratios. Maybe if you somehow could listen to the sounds of the heart, you would know a lot and your listening would not necessarily be hearing pure ratios, but hearing very complicated sounds that sound like whooshing or sound like bellows or sounds like crackling, you know, all the various sounds that you actually hear through a stethoscope. But the thing, the strange thing was, if he had said that, people would have said, I don't know that they, that that idea would have made any sense to anybody because they would have thought like hear the body how could it's too quiet you can't you could barely hear the heart if you you know put your heart you, you couldn't hear anything there but such was the prestige 
of the ideas of the Pythagoreans that people held on to the idea even through its wrongness for thousands of years and kept worrying at it. And then finally, it it moved them to the correct thing. So the straight that so that seemed to me a kind of very surprising thing because usually well maybe it's similar with the idea of atoms the modern idea of atoms is not the idea that the ancient greeks first had of their little tiny little pellets of stuff that were there um i guess a modern that was knowledgeable um would say well that's not what an atom really is we now know very differently on the other hand there is some kind of there is some kind of path that led from that idea to the modern idea. I think the path is more, more surprising, more strange in the case of the biomedical sciences than anywhere else, where an idea that was wrong in almost every detail would still somehow maintain and be referred to by people that then were on the track of something that eventually became right. So to me, that's a kind of very interesting, and I, I don't know, I can't think of an example in the physical sciences, which is, which is really, because usually a mistake hits you from the very beginning and stops you from going, taking another further step. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pesek. Um, sorry, I, I was delayed there on muting myself. We did get a, a question in the chat box here. Um, can service animals hear any of the silent seizure sounds and possibly alert the person or a caregiver? I don't know. I doubt it because service animals actually, well, I don't know, actually. I really don't know. But my impression was that dogs' hearings, for instance, is much more acute in the very, very high registers of sound, of very high frequencies. But the seizure, the, the, the frequencies at which the seizures are happening in the nervous system is very low below the sound of a piano and it would be a kind of thumping sound and yet the thumping is not i mean that gives the wrong sense to it because these are electrical impulses in the brain there's no outward sound the way in which the sound was being produced i played to you was the electrical signals from the little boys due to the electrodes around the little boy's head were then collected and passed through a as computer um, kind of basically so that the, you could just take the same pattern of sounds and move them up several octaves until they would be in a range where the human ear could hear them or even the dog's ear could hear them. So I, I mean, I, hard, I scarcely know, and dogs seem to have an amazing sense for the well-being of their, uh, of their caregiver um, that, that goes beyond it. And I'm not sure whether that's their, I had always thought that was their very uh, subtle and well honed response to the person's state of being and if they appeared ill or if something seemed strange or off with them rather than as a result of hearing some kind of a sound but i i really don't know and that seems to be kind of fascinating probably you could so great was the difference between those two sounds that i'd have played for you that almost anyone could learn to hear that a difference of that sort in about which is what they did gave people five minutes of training they're medical students so they had some medical knowledge but they were not neurologists and not trained in epileptologists or something like that specialists in the diagnosis of 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 these kind of conditions but they were able to recognize the onset of these seizures very very accurately in the study that was done at stanford about 90 percent actually better than you would be able to then a medical student would be able to do just looking at the traces of an eeg not having studied for months and months the interpretation of that of those visual traces Thanks, Dr. Pesek. Um, oh, it looks like it looks like we just got another one here. Um, there are harmonic frequencies of things like just the right vibration that collapses a bridge during an earthquake. Is there something like that that is harmful for human bodies? Maybe related to noise, if this makes sense, or other vibrations in the air? Certainly sound can be used to destroy things in the body. This was discovered very early in the development of ultrasound technology when Paul Angevin, who is the French physicist who just before the First World War developed the technology that was essential to the development of sonar and which in turn was essential to the development of uh, 
of the ultrasound techniques that we have now. If the if the ultrasound had a sufficient was sufficiently focused and sufficiently intense, it could actually boil fish in an aquarium or something like that. And it's now routinely, I think, to treat kidney stones. And I had my cataracts operated on last year, and ultrasound is routinely used to destroy ablate the the old lens in the eye in a fraction of a second and without any kind of danger it, you know it, so quickly then they go on to the rest of the operation in which a new lens is put there but also and millions i mean i think at least a million of those procedures are done every year so that that those uses of ultrasound in fact are do do use the what would you say the the possible the disruptive possibilities of ultrasound on the other hand, ultrasound is far less disruptive and invasive um, than uh, radiation, X radiation, or other forms of radiation that are routinely used for, you know, diagnostic scans, which have because the in order to the to, in order to create these invasive effects and enough heat to be able to like to to uh, cause a, a lens in an eye to vaporize, it takes a tremendous amount of energy and has to be focused very very precisely. Um, the discoverer of the, the person, the physician who first really put fetal ultrasound on the map, Ian Donald, conducted many, many experiments using ultrasound far, far higher volumes than were ever used in experiments with, with human subjects and demonstrated that they had no, um, no physiological bad effects. He said it was no more than listening to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony was his comparison, um, which I thought was kind of funny that, that you would use that as a as an example. So um, yeah, these celebrated examples of resonance in which the singer hits just the right note and the wine glass explodes certainly are possible, but they take a, a lot of energy focused in a very, 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 very tightly to get that to happen. So that when they did that to my eye, the lens, they could, they could remove the lens, which is a tiny little thing, and I not even notice it, and it certainly didn't hurt any of the surrounding tissue. So in that sense, it is far, a far more suitable and, and less problematic diagnostic way of looking inside the body than x-rays or something else in which every, every exposure has the possibility of some kind of damage to the tissue. Thanks, Dr. Pesek. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Um, so if nobody else has any questions, maybe I'll maybe I will just ask one last one if that's all right with you. Um, this was something I, I was kind of thinking about as you were presenting um, that many of the developments you had described involved listening to various sounds, um, not all of which are musical in the ordinary sense. Um, so what is the relationship between music and sound in a broader sense that goes beyond music? Yeah, it's a very it's a very fair question because in my title I foreground music, but a lot of the sounds that I even played to you just now were scarcely musical. But that's somehow because it's a little bit it's a little bit like the story that I was telling about Herophilus that the a certain very narrow idea later on can be broadened so that although musical sound was restricted for a very long time, well into the 19th century, to be just well-defined pitches, basically that lie on a piano keyboard or something like that, if we're talking about Western music, people realized that those were only a small a small sample of a much larger universe of sound in which the sounds would not be so precisely regulated, whose pitch could be less well-defined, whose timbre above all could be much more complex. And those were in fact the kind of sounds that were found by Lenek, for instance, in the body, or by Onbrugger, and he had to try to find musical ways of describing what the sounds were like that he was hearing um, by comparing them with the sounds of drums that were muffled in different ways. So that in that sense, music in the narrower sense of musical pitches of the ordinary sort led people to attend to sound, to be ready to attend to sound in general. And so in that sense, the step from music to a much broader concept of sound for it happened also in music itself because musical sounds started to include things like wind machines and tam tams and drums that don't have pitches in the normal sense but became part of the orchestra 
Um, and so the, a similar development happened in science. The search to find musical sounds in the body, like Marquet was trying to do, very quickly gave way to hearing what ad the body was actually sounding, which occasionally was, strangely enough, whistling and musical pitches that, that Lenek was able to write down in musical notation. But far more often than not, it was a complex, modern kind of soundscape that he had to find a new way of describing. Dr. Pesek, thank you so much for um, for joining us um, virtually up in Los Alamos this evening for this talk. Um, and everyone, please watch for a couple of performances that Dr. Pesek will um, will be giving in Los Alamos um, when the weather warms up. Um, we had originally um, scheduled a couple piano performances um, for today and tomorrow around lunchtime, but have decided to move those um, because the COVID numbers have been quite high. And I think um, a lot of people were sort of inclined to stay in. So, all right, everybody, thanks again. Really appreciate you coming out. Um, good, to, good to see you all online and we'll see you again soon. Take care. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks everyone. Good night. Good night.